Sponsored by National Canine Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this sponsor. Welcome to National Canine Academy Radio, and I want to wish a very happy holidays to all of our listeners out there. Happy holidays, Damien. Hey, happy holidays. Dan, how are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Very good. Very good. Uh, Damien is, of course, our uh, producer who keeps us uh, on the air and keeps things running smoothly, and that's Tried a to. very busy job for him. I'm your host, Dan Stallings, and I want to welcome you back to National Canine Academy Radio. Dallas will be uh, joining us here momentarily. Uh, we have some uh, some very special guests on this week. I'm very excited about this week's show, uh, given that the holidays are the time of year for giving. Um, we have uh, a couple of uh, people, uh, very special people coming on that are uh, uh, very much I see eye to eye with. Um, one is uh, from National Mill Dog Rescue. They go around the country and rescue um, puppy mill dogs and give them uh, a new lease on life and uh, hope for a better life. That's uh, Teresa Strader. And then uh, we have the folks from... Uh, working uh, from National Canine Working Dog, uh, who uh, do a lot to promote um, the betterment of the life of retired working dogs, both military, police dogs, etc. So uh, I'm very interested in talking to these folks and uh, more about their work and finding out what we can do to help. So, um, but uh, so very good show. Looking forward to having them on. I've, I've yet to speak to either of them personally. I've uh, dealt a lot uh, with them over the uh, internet and um, their their pages and whatnot and see the good work that they do and they're nationally recognized for things they're doing the bill of rights and whatnot but uh, but also given it's the holidays I want to talk a little bit uh, first about uh, partying with your your animals partying with your dogs that's right as we all do uh, this time of year everybody's celebrating the new year and uh, you know if the dogs part of your family that obviously changes things a little bit and you do have to take some precautions much like if you have children um, there's some things that I think uh, uh, some of us do or have done in the past that we're not aware of may not be in the dog's best interest and uh, well, obviously some of them have to do with partying and fireworks and, and such but uh one of the things, obviously, people do this time of year, as I know you will be doing, Damien, is uh, indulging a little bit in uh, some beverages. Here and there. Yeah, here and there. And, there. Uh, and they're not all good for your dogs. Huh. Yeah. Uh, alcohol, believe it or not, is not good for your dog. Now, now, how much alcohol? Because every now and then you'll see that at a cookout well, or, you know, a family yeah. thing. You know, somebody gives the beer, <laughs> the little bit of beer to the dog. Everybody bellies up, right? And loves it. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it depends on the size of the dog. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Just uh, like people. Smaller dogs. Yeah, exactly. And, and how much they drink. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, and but if, if they're driving or not, too. Right, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and here's what is the appropriate drinking age for a dog? Is it three or 21? It's hmm? a very good so question. People don't think about that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, alcohol, though. I mean, I think everybody's. I've seen, seen my dad do it in the past, years ago when I was a little kid, you know, pour sure. a little on the, on the floor and the we dog wraps it up. Yeah. We had a Malamute that would bring you a little bowl and would just absolutely love it. And, uh, and, and every time it just bring you this little bowl and you just give it a little yeah. bit and it's, you know, runs around, chases its tail. It seems to love it. And, and we think it's harmless, but in reality, it's actually toxic to the dog. So please do not give your dog any alcohol. Um, no, no drinking or barking. But, uh, but, you know, you want to keep them safe. And, and things like uh, the fireworks, too, which obviously are inevitable this time of year. Um, so you want to be careful with that. A lot of dogs, I even have a couple of uh, rescues that are what we call thunderphobic. They don't like loud noises, uh, fireworks included. So you want to, uh, you know, kind of watch them. Obviously, there's, there's, there is one hysterical video I've seen, and I'll actually put it on our Facebook page later. It's uh, uh, their set, family setting off some fireworks. It looks like a, a July 4th celebration because they're all wearing – you know, short sleeve shirts, either that or somewhere down south. But uh, uh, they set a Roman candle in the ground, and it, you know, it shoots off little yeah. fireballs. Have you seen it? And then, I have and, seen it. And that. then the dachshund comes up and grabs it, and starts running around, and now it's shooting out horizontally, and they're running around scampering, and people are jumping in the air. Everybody's laughing. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm not sure, but I think I've seen a longer video where he actually runs in the house with it. Oh wow! And that is hysterical. I mean, <laughs> so that's just. One of the precautions, but the main one we really want to talk about is, you know, the dogs are thunderphobic and they're terribly stressed out and anxious around the fireworks. Um, so obviously it's a little later, so hopefully some of them will be asleep. But there are some things that you can do to help comfort your dog. There are some uh, things out there that can help as well. There's uh, what's called the thunder shirt, which, you know, swaddles the dog. 
and wraps them up and and also supposedly helps during uh, thunderstorms. Um, we've tried it at uh, National Canine Academy with you know limited success. I have talked to some clients who've actually found some success with it. There is one I do want to try called the Anxiety Wrap, which actually uses some acupressure points as well as the swaddling. So I'm anxious to try that out. Um, there are other things too. Well, one thing that people do that I don't think they realize is uh, when they kind of try to comfort their dog and pet them and tell them it's okay or hold them. And that can actually be detrimental, believe it or not. That actually um, can cause uh, problems because you're telling your dog, this is okay. I like this behavior. You're rewarding it. And people don't realize that. So you don't want to um, uh, kind of try to comfort them, which is, uh, of course, is what we do. We nurture things, you know, people and animals that we care about. But in the, in the dog's case, they don't think like that. They think you're telling them that's okay. You should be concerned. I'm concerned too when you're actually concerned about the dog. So and people don't realize that. But um, one, uh, one of the other things that uh, that you can do and one of the better things you can do is distract them and play games with them. If they're distracted by food treats, for example, you can do obedience. And it actually works. I've actually done that. I have one of my rescues, one of my working dogs, um, Alvin, um, who's a very successful dock diver. We were actually at an event. And uh, it was an outdoor dock diving event, and it started thundering and lightning. And they wanted to finish the event. I was like, well, you know, I don't know about this, but they're like, come on, let's go. It was one of the last events of the day, so we went up on the dock. And Alvin's usually mild to moderately thunderphobic. Um, he usually he just changes in his attitude. He kind of hovers near you. You know, he's not destructive or um, not shaking or anything like that like we've seen some. But we got up on that dock. He could have cared less that there was thunder and lightning in the distance. He was all about dock diving. So distracting the dogs actually works. It's one of the things that you can do to help ease some of their discomfort and, and their anxiety. But you want to distract them. Don't try to just comfort them and pet them and hold them. You, know, you can look at thunder shirts, anxiety wraps, distracting them. Um, and, you know, there are some collars and some, uh, some actually things you can plug in the wall that emit pheromones, which supposedly help calm them. Um, it's something you can try. And then, of course, last resort, not a big fan of it, but last resort, if it's a really stressful situation, uh, is consult your, uh, your veterinarian uh, about some medications to help calm them. So those are some of the things that you can do to try to uh, help your dog through the holidays, through celebrations, thunderstorms, things like that, which may make them anxious. And, of course, you can always consult a local uh, trainer or behaviorist like us at National Canine Academy. But um, what I want to do now is I want to uh, bring in – uh, Teresa Strader from National Mill Dog Rescue. Um, she, again, uh, travels around the country. Her organization travels around the country and uh, rescues mill dogs, puppy mill dogs. So I want to welcome Teresa to the show. Teresa, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Um, very well. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Happy holidays to you, too. Thank you. Uh, I have my uh, my co-host Dallas here uh, and uh, uh, Damien, who you may have talked to on the phone. But, uh-huh. uh, so we're, we're very interested in hearing um, more about your organization. So if you could uh, tell us a little bit about when you started it. Oh, sure. Back in 2007, uh-huh. I'll try to brief, make this as brief as I can, I received through one of my doggy news groups on my email I received an email that was cross-posted in the group, and it, it just said one very short sentence, 50 Italian greyhounds in need, and a phone number. And I have all of my life been completely enamored in love, and I had rescued and placed many over the years. <clears throat> I've been involved in rescue since I was a little kid, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I called that phone number, and the lady told me it's a, it's a big commercial breeder, big puppy mill, going out of business. And she's auctioning her entire kennel, 561 dogs. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and 49 were Italian greyhounds. So I said, well, I know the breed well. I've rescued and placed many over the years. I'm happy to help. You know, I, I, at that moment, I said, with two or three of them, if that would be of any use to you. So, of course, she checked out my references, called me back, said, please, yes, we need the help. We're going to try to get every single one of them that they could out of the auction. They had raised some money <clears throat> through the Italian Greyhound Rescue Community to buy these dogs out of the auction. Mm-hmm. And get them Because most dogs at auction, many people aren't even aware that auctions take place, but they do a lot in the state of Missouri primarily. Um, and you, your big auction audience is other breeders, other puppy mills that are you know, buying and selling dogs there. So, <clears throat> now, who's the auction run through? Is it through the state? Uh, there, no, there's a, uh, there are several auction houses in the state of Missouri. That particular one was called Southwest kennel auction so um that they actually have kennel auctions yes oh yes now i will say there that industry is somewhat dying um 
he used to have a couple of auctions just about every weekend throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Now there's about one a month. So it is getting better. The surplus of dogs has has changed dramatically over the past, you know, five years, I would say, mm-hmm. More, most especially in the last two years. But at any rate, I, I told the lady uh, I would help with two or three of them, which at that time I usually fostered one dog at a time, but because there were so many and it was such a kind of a dire situation, I said I could help with two or three of them. The problem was um, the rescue was in Ohio, and the dogs were in Missouri, and I live in Colorado. <laughs> so how, you know, the question became how would I get the dogs that they wanted me to take. So I quickly realized that I would probably have to go to this event <laughs> and um, <clears throat> transport the dogs back home myself. So I was told by them at that time there were not very many rescues at all that attended auctions, and it was kind of a very quiet thing. You didn't, if if a rescue did attend an auction, you know, you kind of kept your mouth shut and just followed the crowd, and you didn't you didn't talk about being a rescue or any such thing because it was very new that the rescue community was kind of penetrating the commercial breeding world. So. As I was told, you know, just follow the crowd, go get your auction ticket, don't bid on any dogs. You know, they were, they were going to manage that side, and when this whole day was over, they would give me, you know, a couple of dogs to come home with. So I did that, just that. And it, sometimes um, when it's a large breeder going out of business like that, uh, they bring the auction to the property. <clears throat> In other words, in the auction house has their own auction barn, but, um, you know, when it's uh, 561 dogs like that, they just did the auction there. They set up a couple of tents and do the auction on site. So we were actually, you know, when I arrived, I, we arrived at the puppy mill. <clears throat> it wasn't just the auction house. So, um, you know, here for the first time in my life, having been involved in rescue since I was young, you know, I walked right into the world of, of puppy milling and, um, it was, you know, it was a, a shocking experience. I went, I went and signed in and got my auction ticket because that's what they told me to do. And then you get a catalog, and it had all the dogs listed exactly as they would come across the auction table. How many dogs? Was it just this one kennel? Or were one there... kennel, yeah. One kennel, 561 dogs. She probably had uh, 20 or 30 different breeds. <clears throat> um and, you know, Italian Greyhounds was just one of those breeds. There were 49 Italian Greyhounds in that auction. And there were sheep, Inus and Chihuahuas and Poodles and, you know, just you name it, everything. A pretty traditional puppy mill style thing. So I walked, you know, got my auction tag and just followed the crowd into the first little building where some of her dogs were housed. And, all, you know, I mean, walking through that door, um, I had heard about puppy mills. I think, you know, we had all heard the term, everybody in rescue anyway. Right. Um, but to be standing there inside the building, looking at the dogs in the little wire cages, uh, their frantic, you know, desperate desire to not be in those cages and yet being very fearful of people because they've only ever been in those cages, it was just <clears throat> immediately shocking, you know, so incredibly sad to see you know our best friends just caged up and and you know frantic I mean, their whole entire life is about every single one of those little 30 by 30 by 30 inch cages has one male and two or three females mostly small breed dogs and their whole life is about producing puppies nothing else that, that when, wasn't when set the, up just for the the auction that was pretty much how they were have they been so living yeah this yeah this was these were the buildings they had lived in all their lives mm-hmm. and you know they would move them from the from the cage to the auction tent you know according to the schedule of the catalog so but what you do when you first get there you're going in to look at the dogs the breeders are mostly going in to look at the dogs they want to buy and then you kind of mark it on your catalog or whatever so i just you know walked in that first building <clears throat> the first thing that overwhelms you is the smell. Uh, It was, you know, just a lot of ammonia and kind of a horrific smell, and then just seeing the dogs, you know, frantically pacing in their cages and actually seeming like they want 
the contact from you, but then when you get close to them, they all retreat to the back of the cage because they're scared. They're not used to that. Right. Their yeah. whole life has been inside that cage, and it's small. Believe me, it's very small. Now, I have to admit, um, uh, that was kind of a shock, what you just said to me about them having kennel auctions. That's something I am not familiar with whatsoever. H- how big of a problem is this in puppy mills here in the States? Oh, it's <clears throat> enormous. I will say that through you know, education and awareness, um, it is getting much better than it was when I well, that was in 2007 mm-hmm. so six going on seven years ago at that time there were over 3,800 licensed USDA licensed breeders in the state of Missouri it was the biggest and still is the biggest breeding state in the country um, is that because the, the laws and regulations are lax there or <clears throat> why is that well <laughs> the history behind it I, I don't know how much you want me to talk about this I don't want to take up too much time but the history behind it and the reason that the big agriculture states throughout the Midwest are the big puppy mill states, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Um, after World War II, when all of our soldiers came home, agriculture, of course, was <clears throat> in the toilet because we had just been through a world war. So, you know, family farms were struggling. and But while our soldiers were in Europe, they were constantly exposed to purebred dog ownership. You know, this is in the late 40s. Uh, Here, it wasn't a big deal at that time. You know, we all have the story of grandma and grandpa's dog that was, you know, either chained to a tree or just ran around the farm. We didn't keep dogs the way we do now. And so they were exposed to that in in Europe because that's always been a big thing in Europe. So there was an increased interest in purebred dog ownership, which led to an increased demand. So the USDA as an attempt to stimulate the agricultural industry, encouraged farmers to essentially raise a whole new crop, puppies. They subsidized it. They imported the dogs. They brought them to the farms. The farmers, in fairness, of course, had no idea how to raise dogs, nothing, you know, no idea what to look for in confirmation, temperament, or anything. And they didn't exactly have great places to house the dogs they had barns and rabbit hutches and so that's the way it started it hasn't progressed much since then it doesn't sound like what's that it hasn't progressed much since then it doesn't sound like well now it has uh in the last just really couple of years i mean there were well i mean as as far as the conditions i mean took off like wildfire Mm -hmm. right there in the early 50s pet stores start popping up everywhere you know people went crazy so is that of course is that the one of the main outlets for puppy mills then yes Okay. Pet stores, absolutely, and the Internet. Mm-hmm. Pet stores and the Internet. Um, you know, even in your local newspapers, um, when you see puppies for sale, um, here in Colorado, you know, there's a lot of backyard breeders, which basically are not a whole lot different than puppy mills. They're a little bit maybe set up differently, maybe don't have, you know, five to 500 to 1,000 dogs, but, you know, 100, and they all have the same problems. They're, you know, none of the money that these folks make goes back into those dogs in any way, medical care or any other thing. So they wind up with a lot of the same problems. But anyway. Now about how many, uh, I'm sorry, now about how many uh, puppy mill dogs do you think you've saved so far? Well, actually, I know exactly how many. (laughs) Um, I came home from that auction with 13 dogs (laughs) and a huge determination in my heart to make a difference for them and i got to work quickly um luckily for me colorado was a very dog loving state a very volunteer oriented state you know we immediately started getting quite a bit of help from the community i mean it took a while obviously to get this on its feet but uh since that day we have rescued 8,437 puppy mill dogs wow and uh seven, not quite seven years that's awesome Yep. I've got about a minute left here. Can you tell people um, how they can find you and what they can do to help National Mill Dog Rescue? Sure. Yeah, we have a ton of volunteer opportunities for local people uh, and even nationally, people that can work from home on their computer for us. Or Our website is milldogrescue.org. You can read more about the history of the dog that really inspired me that I, that I took that day from that place. Okay. Um, her name was Lily. You can read her story, and that will probably inspire people to, to help in some way as Great. well. We can always use donations, of course. We are 
run probably 95% by volunteers. All right. The only paid staff we have is our vet staff. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa, for joining us. Uh, we will definitely have you back on the show. And you've been listening to National Canine Academy Radio. You heading home from the holidays? Expect wind and rain in the mid-Atlantic, more snow in New England and in the nation's midsection. We've got another Arctic plunge that is going to move across the Great Lakes and the Midwest. Fox meteorologist Janice Dean. A story in the New York Times contradicts congressional reports regarding the 9-11 Benghazi attack, instead saying a months-long investigation points to an anti-Islamic video as being the spark that resulted in the killings of four Americans and that al-Qaeda was not involved. One Democratic congressman says neither side's telling the whole story. I don't think it's complete uh, and I don't think either paradigm is really accurate here. California Representative Adam Schiff, Michigan Republican Mike Rogers says the Times is wrong. They didn't talk to people on the ground who were doing the fight and the shooting and the intelligence gathering. When you put that volume of information I think it uh, proves that that story is just not accurate. Both were on Fox News Sunday. Fox News, we report, you decide. Christopher Newport University's Ferguson Center for the Arts presents the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Saturday, January 11th at 8 p.m. Joining the RPO is principal guest conductor and violin soloist Pincus Zuckerman, who has remained a phenomenon in the world of music for decades. Acknowledged as one of the UK's most prodigious orchestras, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, RPO, enjoys an international reputation for bringing audiences worldwide first-class performances and the highest possible standards of music making. Selections range from Bach's Violin Concerto in A minor to Brahms' Double Concerto in A minor. Don't miss the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Saturday, January 11th at 8 p.m. Tickets starting at just $27 are on sale now at fergusoncenter.org, the ticket office, or by calling toll-free 855-FERGTIX. Visit fergusoncenter.org for details. Season sponsored by Ferguson Bath Kitchen and Lighting Gallery. My family is active morning, noon, and night. But when someone isn't feeling well, I turn to a place with a schedule that fits ours. Patient First. They provide urgent care for routine injuries and illnesses from 8 in the morning to 10 at night every day of the year. So my husband and I can stop in before or after work or on weekends. And you never need an appointment, which means I can take Danny in after soccer practice to have my ankle checked out without having to wait long. And you know what? My grandma goes to patient first. Because every center has physicians on duty for the care I need. Plus x-rays, lab tests, and prescription drugs are under one roof. That saves my daughter <laughs> from having to drive all over town. Patient First also provides primary care for individuals without a regular physician. Patient First, for more than 30 years, the care you need, when you need it. Now in Hampton on West Mercury Boulevard. Nine Hampton Roads Area Medical Centers. Learn more at patientfirst.com. This is a paid commercial program that is sponsored by National Canine Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this sponsor. Welcome back to National Canine Academy Radio. I'm your host, Dan Stallings, along with my co-host, Dallas Bolin. Hello. And Damian on the dials. This segment is brought to you by National Canine Academy, located right here in Virginia Beach, Virginia, 5503 Virginia Beach Boulevard. All breed dog training, daycare, boarding, grooming. Give us a call at 289-2700 or look us up on the web at nationalcanineacademy.com. And with us on the show now is Jay Moranchek from uh, National Canine Working Dog. How are you doing, Jay? I'm doing good. How are you today? Um, well, thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for joining us. And, Same to you all. Uh, Great we, to be here. Yeah, we, we mentioned uh, last week on our show uh, one of the stories you had on your Facebook page about Dino. We'll get to him uh, in just a minute. But I wanted to have you on. We've also posted links to your page on uh, our show's Facebook page. And I wanted to have you on to tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at National Canine Working Dog. Okay. Well, we at National Canine Working Dog uh, found out several years ago uh, the, the the horrendous um, problems that these police canines and military canines have after they're retired. Uh, apparently, because police canines in this country are considered equipment, uh, they do not receive any medical benefits when they're retired. Mm -hmm. And that leaves the financial responsibilities up to the handlers. And if the handlers' financial responsibilities include a family and children, 
well, where does that dog end up in the in the pile? Right. Now, I don't know if you realize, but we're also, this is a military uh, community here. We have the largest naval base in the world right here in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. So military is very important to us, and you know, we're always very in tune with the stories of our our uh, you know, men and women overseas, and we're very supportive of them. So but I, I don't think a lot of people actually think about the, the work in canines over there. I mean, you know, we hear about the troops all the time, but you're right. I mean, the, the canines, and they're the ones that are safeguarding a lot of our men and women over there, and people right, don't, people don't think about doing, that. They're the ones doing the work. They're right in the front lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're injured, uh, you know, relatively uh, often in, in the positions they're in, uh, and a lot of times these... Uh, injuries cause them to be retired Mm -hmm. once they're retired if the injuries are substantial those expenses need to be taken care of and usually the handler cannot and thanks for clinton uh he uh president clinton uh signed a bill allowing these uh military dogs to be adopted uh before that they weren't even allowed to be adopted out when they were hurt injured or retired so at least now they can be adopted out and there is a chance for that bills to be paid medically wise uh and they get a a pretty nice retirement if they are adopted out but still again these dogs as the police canines served our country they gave us their 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 services and they of course sacrificed what they have sacrificed their health uh to provide for us and keep us safe and they're doing many of the jobs that our soldiers don't want to do or have to do like checking for explosives you know uh ieds example you know and clearing uh you know the housing and whatnot of of any of the uh combatants that may be in there i mean they're going places where we don't want to send our, our men and women so they're they're literally on the front line they're even out there in front of our guys Right, and exactly, and they, these dogs, you know, as brave and as loyal as they are, mm-hmm. and the work they do for our, for for us as humans, we feel that they deserve some kind of benefits when retired. Absolutely. So th- this is what we've done. Uh, we've had we we're, it is two pronged because you have the military working dogs, which are part of the government, and then you have all of your police canines across the nation which belong to various departments, whether they be city or local or state. And these dogs also are considered equipment. They're not considered living creatures. And they're protecting so, us right here at home and protecting our children by getting drugs off the street. Drugs, criminals. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, these guys, when everybody's running out of the building, the dogs are running in. Exactly. Sure. And if I can add this one thing, uh, my brother was a bomb dog handler in Afghanistan, the first set of Marines that actually went over with bomb sniffing dogs. And it was, uh, you know, they would put the dog out in front of everybody because they trusted the dog's right. nose far beyond trusting the radar or somebody out there trying to detect the IEDs, which saved right. a lot of their lives over and over. Yeah. But a lot of these dogs, when they get out of a tour in, in uh, Afghanistan or in any of these countries, they normally go right back into it. They'll get put on another bomb dog handler and put right back into the action two, three times times over where our service members get a little bit of a, a reprieve in between and uh, the dogs actually face a lot of the same PTSD uh, situations from a lot of the very extreme situations that they're faced with uh, you know and my brother ha- you know had accounts of that firsthand but yeah they, they're extremely hard working and they don't get very much of a break in between tours yeah no, no, and if they do get adopted out as I say after they're retired uh, they're, they're the lucky ones Mm-hmm. They are the lucky ones, the ones that get re- get retired and get adopted out. On um, the others, I, I don't. You know, it's it's just so hard for me to say. And what happens to these dogs? But and the same thing with these police canines. Uh, you know, one way of looking at it from the administrative point of view. Okay, here you have a dog. Maybe it's a bomb dog. Maybe it's a, a patrol dog. But here you have this dog that maybe has been working for five, six years. Maybe he's seven or eight now, and he goes out and he gets injured in the field, on duty. In the line of duty, he gets injured. Well, he comes back and they go, okay, well, he has a broken leg and a broken this, and it's going to cost um, seven to $8,000 in medical bills. And they'll look and they'll say, well, we can get another dog for 10 So administration says, okay, he's done for. Give the bill to the handler. If he wants to take care of the dog and pay for the medical bill, We'll retire the dog. It's his. He can pay the medical bill, and we'll buy us a new dog. Wow. And those are the things that are happening across the country right now. And and to some people, you know, that may not be as important, but 
you know, to, to dog owners and, and again, to think about, you know, these dogs, these are, you know, our husbands, wives over there, sons, daughters, they're safeguarding their well being, not just the handler, the entire unit and right. even the units that come behind them. I mean, these dogs are out there and they're, they're heroes. I mean, that's the and way they should be dumping, looked at. And yet we're dumping these dogs on the handler saying you pay the bill now. And then if that, like right. you said, if that, that they can't handle that, then, well, you know, what happens to the dog? Right. Well, not only that, if they can't handle it, the dog doesn't get the treatment it needs. Maybe it needs ten thousand dollars of treatment, and the guy can only afford a thousand. Mm-hmm. So it's it's according to the financial responsibilities of the handler of what what he's capable of doing, and why should it be that way? What we've done is we've come up with a unique, a very unique way of paying for the retirement of all the police canines in the United States. How we do that is through the Crime Protection Control Act, uh, the uh, 1994 Crime Control Act, uh, which uh, allows for uh, apprehension of assets in illegal crime, meaning drug dealers who are found with drugs and cash lose their homes, lose their houses, lose their cars and the cash, and they are forfeited to the government. The government, in return, then filters this money down through all the departments. Okay, and that all those assets across the United States, across the uh, all the police departments, get a piece of that action from all these assets that are received. All we ask to do is, since a lot of the dogs are responsible for finding this illegal cash and illegal goods, let the dogs get 20% of the cash assets found in this country. So that 20%. Spoils. That 20% that the dog should get mm-hmm. from finding these assets would approach anywhere between 4 and $6 million a year. $30 million is this low figure that was found last year. Wow. That's staggering. That's in cash. That's in cash alone. That's not including the cars, the farms, the assets, the boats, just the cash. We don't care about the assets and the farms and the boats, but give the dogs 20% of the cash. That means that these dogs could be cared for. It would not hurt anybody's budget except for how it filters down throughout the uh, United States. But the dogs deserve the 20%. Now, how many working canines are out there? Huh. That is a good question. Nobody knows. Uh, some, some kind of guesstimate? Well, I, right now, right now we are trying to just get numbers for the state of Florida that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by those estimates, and, and we have no, and these estimates are not correct. We, we're trying to filter through the information we have to get a real estimate. And we're working with uh, several organizations to help us get those that certify these dogs. So they, these are the only people who really actually know the numbers out there by the certifications. But certifications could be certified in patrol, certified in drugs. So these dogs may have more one certification, so that has to be filtered out to right. which dogs and how many, uh, how many are out there, uh, because we really don't have any idea. I mean, there's really no way of guessing. So I mean, I would say maybe maybe two to three thousand dogs per state. So there's no way to tell how many are falling through the cracks and not getting the proper care, not getting into a, a good home and living a you know a good life after they're done and retired. Right. Exactly. There's wow. no way of knowing any of that. And since their equipment, they're they're like a desk or a chair that's been thrown out. Do you keep track of those? Wow. And, and then we mentioned last week uh, about uh, Dino, who ended up in a shelter, a former police right. dog. I mean, that's right. just... And we, don't, we don't even know the process of how that happened because those, those dogs are, first of all, getting them out there like that and could be a liability. If that dog was to accidentally hurt somebody, they have to follow back to how that dog got out, right. how such a... A dog could get out like that, and why it ended up where it did. It's a shame that we're treating our, our canine veterans like this, both military and police. That it really is, and, and I'm glad you guys are doing something about it. Where can uh, people go to learn more about uh, what you guys do at National Canine Working Dog and what they can do to support your efforts? Well, they can check us out on our Facebook pages, and we have our web pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on our Facebook pages, we have links to the Police Canine Bill of Rights where you can download the entire bill. Uh, We have letters to your congressmen and senators that you can sign and send off. Uh, We also have a petition up on uh, on, uh, change.org to help 
uh, get the word out for these canines. So all of these links are on our web page. You can go to www.nk9wd.com, and that is our regular web pages. Okay. We are a nonprofit. All right. And uh, we, we, we just hope we can get the signatures out there. We have a few things going on that we're trying to uh, make happen in the state of Florida uh, with uh, the state's canines, and we're working with them very closely. Uh, Dr. Ken Simmons, a veterinarian, in, uh, a veterinarian in Florida, has been a big help, and he was the one who did the Drake Memorial. And Drake, I don't know if you're familiar with, was a canine that was uh, a retired canine that was shot and killed in his own home, protecting it from a burglar. Hmm. And um, they tried gallantly to save his life, but they could not. But this dog fought in retirement and stopped that burglar, even though he was shot four times. Unbelievable. So, and he, I'm sorry that he passed, but he was a true hero. And Dr. Ken Simmons at that time realized what these police canines were up against, and he has helped uh, help the cause in Florida, and hopefully we can get the dogs in Florida covered real soon. Very good. Well, we're going to do what we can to help, and uh, we're a big supporter of yours. We definitely believe in what you're doing. We actually posted a link on the radio show's Facebook page, so God bless you for your work. Let us know if there's anything else we can do to help out, and we will no, definitely just, keep an eye on, on your work and what you're doing. We just want to wish the military and the police a uh, very happy and healthy New Year. Stay safe out there. And thank you for all you do. We know the handlers love their animals. We know they want the best for their animals. And we hope that all the handlers come to our site, like us, tell us who you are, let us know, and we want to let everybody else know the work they do. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on, Jay. Thank you for all the work you do. Um, and uh, we will definitely have you back on the show sometime soon. Thank you. We'll definitely keep you informed what's going on. Thank have you so much. Day. You do. Happy Bye. holidays. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. All right, we will be back in just a few minutes with uh, Christine Lacoste from PetsAdvisor.com with the Pet News of the Week. You're listening to National Canine Academy Radio on WNIS. National Canine Academy uses all of its 26,000 square foot fence grass play area, two saltwater pools, and professional trainers to ensure all dogs get plenty of exercise, socialization, and obedience training each day. Every dog is individually trained by a professional trainer. They're the only training facility in the region offering a lifetime money-back guarantee. Call 289-2700. National Canine Academy, where dogs play, stay, and train like a champion. Visit nationalcanineacademy.com. Hi, I'm Mike Improvento with the law firm of Bright Drescher, Improvento, and Walker. I'm a biker and a lawyer. You know, motorcycle riders are the biggest victims of distracted drivers. On a good day, they just don't see us. When you add a cell phone or texting to that mix, it's just unacceptably dangerous. If they don't see you and your ride goes bad, call me, Mike Improvento, at the law firm of Bright Drescher, Improvento, and Walker. 622-6000. 622-6000. Welcome back to National Canine Academy Radio. I'm your host, Dan Stallings. My co-host, Dallas Bolin. Hi. And Damian, pushing the important buttons on the dials. This segment is brought to you by Maverick Detection Services, the country's largest independent canine bed bug detection unit with eight certified bed bug detection dogs. We also provide geese control. We're the only geese control team in the region. You can reach us on the web at todetectandtoserve.com, and you can call us at 855-597-7827. All right. Joining us on the show now is our intrepid reporter, Christine Lacoste from PetsAdvisor.com. How are you doing, Christine? Doing good. How are you, Dan? I'm doing very well. Dallas is here with me, and, uh, of course, you uh, you talked to Damien on the phone. I understand you're back in the States now. Yes, it's nice to be home. I'm <laughs> glad to have you back over here. Um, so uh, I'm sure you saw some of the stories um, even that occurred on your side of the water while you were over there uh, that were in the news recently. Uh, about yeah. uh, some of these miracle stories this time of year. None, none, no better time to tell them. So what have you got for us this week? Uh, let's start with those. There was one that was uh, it's being called a Christmas miracle. It was on a Sunday morning, and a Labrador named Keela and her daughter, Sunny, uh, a woman's daughter, Sunny, went out for a walk. And this is um, actually is the Norfolk coast of the U.K. Um, and the parent dogs got excited when they spotted a seal pup in the water. And they actually went and jumped in to go and play with the seal pup. But a lot of more of the seal pups arrived, and the owner was worried about the condition of the ocean and tried to call them back. Mm -hmm. 
they got one dog back, but the other one wasn't coming back. Uh, they kept ignoring him. So with the help of two kayakers, they soon ended up going out and finding the dog. Um, initially, they thought he was lost. So he went home and tried to tell his wife, you know, we've lost the dog today in the ocean. But the Coast Guard lifeboats actually ended up um, going about a half mile off the coast, and they found the dog. So a good Christmas miracle to get that dog home. Wow. So they were out to play with some sea lions? The seal, well, the seal pups. Seal pups. Wow. That's cool. I've seen the, you know, the pictures of uh, the dogs in the water with uh, uh, dolphins and such. I've never seen them out there with, with you know, baby seals or sea lions. That's pretty cool. And luckily, it was a new friend to play with. Yeah, and they, luckily they're back home safe and sound. So that that's a, a good story. Yep, and another good story coming out of New York City. Uh, Cecil Williams is 60 years old, and he was on a subway platform waiting for a train. He ended up feeling dizzy and falling over, and actually fell onto the tracks. Uh, Williams is also blind, and he was accompanied by his god his guide dog, an 11 year old black lab named Orlando. Mm -hmm. The dog tried to hold him up, but he couldn't, and the dog ended up falling on the tracks as well. Um, it was obvious no one's going to get him up in time because the train was coming. So one of the bystanders yelled to him to put his head down and lay in between the tracks, and hopefully the train would pass over them. Uh, he called out a couple of times. The guy couldn't hear him. He finally must have heard him put his head down, and miraculously the dog did too. Like He was also taking instructions. The train ended up passing directly over them, and once it was cleared, they were both fine. Uh, but aside from a cut to the head for Williams because of the actual fall, they were pretty much untouched. So it was a really good story, and, and the dog saved his life. And I heard, you know, um, a couple other uh, details on this. This happened a few weeks ago, and this apparently has developed, and they've started a fund to uh, take care of them. And, and initially the gentleman was not going to be able to keep the dog, but now apparently he'll be able to. But what I heard on, on one of the news reports was that um, the dog was trying to pull him back away from the edge, and the, right. the gentleman fell. And then the dog, you know, it's, it was his um, assistant's dog, jumped in with him. And then uh, there were some people that came over, and there some other people tried to stop the train. But the the thing that that kind of stuck struck me about this story, and it kind of ties in with um, the uh, the guest we just had on from National Canine Working Dog, is there was only one individual that jumped in to help that man, and that was his dog. No one else jumped in. I know there was a, a train that was coming, but they were also trying to stop the train. But the dog is the one that jumped in to try to help him. So I think that. You know, kind of drives the point home to, you know, what these service dogs do, whether they're military police for the sightseeing, assistance dogs, that's what our dogs do for us. They they will put themselves in harm's way for us. And that, they're fearless, they're courageous, and they don't think twice. To them, it's just natural instinct. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really glad that had such a good ending. I, I just can't imagine how terrifying that must have been to, to witness it, much less live through it. So I'm, I'm very glad that it had such a good ending and he's able to keep the dog and uh, what a story. Yeah, it's, it shows that there were a couple of bystanders, but only one person actually yelled out and told him to put his head down so the train could pass over him. But it doesn't list that anyone, you know, tried to help him except, you know, the dog jumping in after him. Yeah, well, quick thinking. At least quick, one person has a thought to tell him, put your head down. Right, quick thinking. So, well, yeah, thankfully they're both still here and they get to stay together. So that's that's great. It's a happy ending there. Absolutely. Always good to have a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. I've got some weird news about a flying squirrel. Uh, you your last guess was just from Florida, and this story comes out of Florida. A guy named Jeff Longo found a newborn flying squirrel lying on a hot sidewalk in Florida, and no one thought it would survive, but he decided to do some research and started feeding it uh, a mixture of heavy cream and puppy formula, named her Biscuits, and started taking him to work every day and keeping her at home and kept feeding her. Uh, the flying squirrel actually survived, and now at three months old, um, Biscuit's doing great, and she's friends with all of his dogs, so Biscuit's become a pet. Wow, that's interesting. Is he going to keep Biscuit? Uh, so far, it seems he is. Hmm. Interesting. I've never heard of a pet squirrel, flying squirrel even. We'll have to uh, follow through on that story. His dogs all get along with him. Uh, they said they're all friends. Uh, although when, they, when the squirrel is out in the house, it is supervised just in case <laughs> one of the other bigger animals <laughs> injure it. So it is the supervised playtime, but he said they get along great. Uh, for some reason, I have visions of the Griswold family. With the <laughs> I guess it depends the on the breed of his dogs because some are more prey-driven and some are just happy with any animal. Right. But what? it doesn't list the uh, the breeds of his dogs. Okay, uh, that was my next question. Into consideration, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it was, you know, a Weimaraner, you could forget it. <laughs> now, why do you say that? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, let's see. They chase geese, and that's bigger than a squirrel. So I'm thinking the one's going to chase the squirrel. Uh, all right. What else, what else have you got Move, for us? Moving over to Japan. Uh, this is an interesting story. Apparently there was a man. He was unemployed, and he had one cat. But he felt compelled to provide meals for about 20 cats that are housed nearby in a warehouse, plus a population of over 100 strays. Now, what's unique about the story, it's not that he's feeding strays, and obviously a lot of them. He started stealing cash and jewels over the past year, uh, totaling about $185,000. And the reason was because he felt all of those cats and the strays deserved gourmet meals, not cat food. So he started stealing to support his habit of actually buying fresh chicken and fish and feeding 120-plus cats a day. Obviously, eventually he was caught because this is in the news, but that's a bit crazy. How long has that been going on? Uh, about a year. And they, it's, they finally caught him after a year? And they finally caught him after a year, yeah, $185,000. But he was taking care of the cats. That's uh, some lucky cats. And, of course, they had to ride around in a Lamborghini and live in a mansion. Um, no, I don't think so. It doesn't say anything like that. Um, he spent all their money feeding really, cats. Well, you figure 120 cats. If he fed them fresh chicken and fish every day, that would definitely rack up a big bill. My goodness. Well, last story, another feel-good story, and this is coming from New Jersey. Uh, a beagle mix named Daniel was among eight other shelter dogs that were scheduled to be euthanized. Actually, no, he was with 17 other dogs in the gas chamber. And this is not recent because this was back in October when this happened. Um, all the dogs in the gas chamber died, and when they opened the door, Daniel just walked right out. A little bit dazed, but survived. Uh, they really c couldn't quite believe it. So Daniel ended up getting adopted. They didn't try to put him down again. And um, his story has actually encouraged the owner to um, get 31 more states to enforce laws against inhumane forms of euthanizing. So that's uh, something good that's come out of that. And uh, this dog, Daniel, along with eight other ones, are actually scheduled to ride on a float in the Rose Parade this coming New Year's Day. So that's going to be something interesting, and hopefully I think that's on television. How so cool you might that? be able to float with the dogs going by. Just look for that little beagle. Right. And, and how many uh, facilities are there in the country that, that, are, that are, you know, gas dogs like that? I don't have an exact number off the top of my head, but a lot of places still do it. Some uh -huh. of them use, um, obviously, the pink stuff. Right. Injections. So I, I don't have a, a firm number on that. But I'll have to look that up. Well, I'm glad that uh, he's drawing attention to it so people can be more aware of you know, the plight of some of these shelter dogs. And when you do surrender a dog, you know, I think the, the awareness needs to be out there. So I, I'm glad that story's come to light and, uh, and good on you. <laughs> I'm glad he's getting a ride on the parade now and living like a, yeah, the, uh, shelter dog show. sponsored by the Lucy Pet Foundation, and uh, he's actually become the official spokes dog for the organization. So Awesome. Probably going to turn some heads at the prairie, but it's definitely a good story. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, hey, tell us uh, where we can uh, go to learn more about the stories you guys are doing for Pets Advisor. Just go to PetsAdvisor.com and click on the latest buzz from the top header, and you'll get all the new stories, and you can look at recent ones. There's some other ones from Christmas with some funny cat videos, uh, and then, of course, all this news and much more. Awesome. All right, Christine. Well, thank you so much. We'll look forward to you joining us again next week, and uh, so glad to have you back on this side of the water. Yep, thanks. Have a good day. All right, you too. We'll talk to you soon. Happy holidays. And uh, we will start next week uh, with the show the first of the year on the 4th uh, with our So You Want a Dog segment, which is going to take you from deciding on getting a dog to what kind of dog to proper care all the way through senior dog care starting next week right here on National Canine Academy Radio on WNIS. We will uh, join you again in a week. And uh, Dallas, I'll see you next week. Happy yes. New Year. Damien, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Remember to watch out for your dog. Take care of them during the fireworks and uh, make sure they're comfortable. And uh, we will see you guys next week. The preceding paid commercial program was sponsored by National K9 Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this sponsor. Hampton Roads News and Information Station, AM 790, WNIS, Norfolk. It's 11 a.m.